Hello, welcome everyone here in the auditorium or online watching us at planetimpact.nl. Um, this is the panel called Self-Fashioning on Social Media. Um, we'll have three guests um, and have one moderator. I will introduce the moderator and leave it to him to introduce the guests. Uh, your moderator for tonight is Edward Akintola Hubbard, in short, Akin. He's assistant, assistant professor of arts and society for Utrecht University and co-founder of the artist collective Dark Matter. Please welcome Edward Akintola Hubbard. No. team at, at Impact for introducing me and for, for inviting me yet again. Um, it seems like I always do this, I'm always working for, for, for Impact and yeah, they pay me but you know, um, it's still work anyway, right Arion? <laughs> anyway. Anyway, guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I hope this is, a, 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 this is going to be a wonderful discussion and I'm ready to have fun. I'm in that mood. So, first of all, before we jump in, I wanted to just, well, introduce the panel and say what this whole thing is about because um, the panel is titled Self Fashioning, you know, in the age of social media. And the question, of, I mean, this was, a, this was a collaborative effort between myself and, and Arion as curators. And, and so, well, um, and the, the idea of self-fashioning came from me, I mean, the, for, the, for the topic. So I decided, well, I guess the first thing for me to do is, is, is discuss maybe what, what myself, what I thought, or what I think as a curator, um, what I think we mean by self-fashioning. Well, uh, let's see. Um, I think about a generation ago, feminist philosopher Judith Butler declared that gender is a social construct. And of course, you know, added to that, she argued that gender is something we actually wake up and perform each and every day of our lives. Well, for those of us who have done you know, feminist studies or feminist philosophy or, or gender studies of any kind, we know that after that, all hell broke loose. All hell broke loose in the world because, you know, what, what the hell does she mean? You know, the gender is, a, is, a, is performed, you know, don't I have a dick, don't I have a pussy, blah, 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 blah. You see, well, those were the bad old days because I don't think, not even Judith Butler could have anticipated the world we live in today. And I say that because, well, as Ariane um, can tell you, my first idea for this panel was to, well, at least I was going to present on Lil Nas X. Because, of course, I mean, I don't, I, it's almost kind of obvious why that would be a choice, because I think Lil Nas X is one of the uh, you know, young black queer artists who is really, really you know, bending, all the, uh, you know, um, um, bending all the rules, as they say, breaking all the rules, um, and really, really queering hip hop, um, which I think a generation ago nobody thought could be queered. Um, and he's doing it so beautifully and, and with so much, you know, with so much um, chutzpah. On, online and particularly with, with, with um, social media and platforms like, like Instagram. And so, of course, it leads me to believe, oh my God, you know, you can almost do anything and be anything on Instagram. And quite frankly, I think um, the career of Lil Nas X proves to us that, well, even, even something like music and being a musician has been so stretched and expanded um, beyond what we knew, you know, 20 years ago. You know, what is now a musician's musical campaign is a whole bunch of different things other than just simply music videos and, and, and record sales, of course, right? And if you go on, on to Lil Nas X's um, his IG, IG account, it's like every single day, it's another sort of explosive um, you know, um, set of images. I don't. Did you guys see the one where he was pregnant before the, before the album before the album was released, etc., etc. So I think that's where we started with this very really light-hearted topic. It was going to be a lot of joy and a lot of celebration. 
But then when we met, I think when myself, when I met with the two presenters here, Kira Gaunt and, and Marika de Rover, who are going to explain their, their own art practice to you. I, I don't like to give out these, these, these bios but because I like, I like you to tell your own stories. But anyway, when I sat down with, with these two presenters, I started to realize that, well, there's so many other kinds of stories to tell about self-fashioning um, on the internet. And I think this is, of course, why, well, I, I mean, apart from the fact that Lil Nas X is living proof that there's, there's, there's something to celebrate about self-fashioning, things like liberation, but there's also much that should give us pause. Okay, the two presenters we have here are, well, I think, well, first of all, they prove that, you know, um, I think as Lil Nas X proves that, well, the internet has stretched the boundaries of what we call art, right? Because, of course, the internet has introduced a much more democratized landscape of artistic practice. You know, it is a mu it's, the internet is now a place that allows for a much more expansive sense of what an artist is. Okay, but when, anyway, when I met the two, pr the two, the two presenters today, I realized that they have two extremely unique takes on self-fashioning. They both tell radical, radically different kinds of stories about the same kind of internet. And so, with, without further ado, I would like to just um, jump into what will be a hybrid um, panel between, between Mareika, who will go first, and Kira, who will go second. And it's going to be, I hope, a very, a very uh, lively discussion and a very informal one. I think Mareika is already ready to perform because she's going to also incorporate performance into her presentation right here on stage. So. <laughs> So I'm really excited. We should be really excited. And she's sitting right in front of us, dressed like a fairy princess. <laughs> Marika, could, you, could I please welcome you to the stage? <laughs> and, and also, I would like to ask um, that Kira Gaunt join us. Um, Kira is joining us from New York City. Hi, Kira. Can everybody hear her? Okay. Now, as I said, I want you guys to sort of introduce yourselves and so you can toss right into your stories and make, you know, make your stories part of, part of your identity to the audience. But without further ado, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do I start? Ah, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, you told me you didn't prepare so much, but you lied to me. No, I did not lie. Uh, yeah, you did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, because for me, I think it will be a bit more um, freestyle. I'm also not performing. I'm performing tonight. Uh, so I didn't like really prepare something very um, fixed. Um, do I need to introduce myself? Of like what? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows me. <laughs> um, so um, um, I'm a Brussels. Uh, Belgium-based um, performance artist. Um, well, I only started uh, really performing, um, like stage performance, in 2018. I did another performance uh, in 2012, um, which was a year-long performance. I will um, talk a little bit about uh, later. Um, I have work in the Modern Love Show, which is a series of memes that will also come back in the performance. Uh, I wanted to say, like, I, um, I was born in 1990, so um, I have a very specific take on what it means to be uh, part of the internet and especially social media platforms, because I think, um, as we discussed before, that I am uh, part of that first generation that really grew up um, with the internet, on the internet. Um, well, I think probably the introduction um, just like is part of the presentation and then Absolutely. if you have any questions, yeah, you, can, you can ask <laughs> later. So, this beginning um, still, I don't know from when it was, but it was from my time uh, on Tumblr, which was after uh, MySpace, the first platform that was uh, really uh, important to me. I want to say that like, um, I come from, from like a tiny village, of course, it's still Belgium, um, but my parents were quite conservative, also not very LGBTQ friendly. Uh, also went to a very Catholic um, girls' school, and so there was very little um, representation of queer people in uh, my um, direct environment. So 
to be able to log on to um, the internet. And I have to say, it was really cute. Once I started to question my uh, sexuality, I had a teacher uh, in high school, because I was quite young still, I had a teacher in high school who let me use uh, the computer in one of the rooms during um, like lunch breaks. Uh, so there was this website for young people, well, young ni tetero. Um, that, I, that I got to research <laughs> so that I didn't have to use the internet at home and like to create a safe space for me, which I'm still very grateful for. Um, so then uh, I started to um, connect with people on the internet who were also questioning their sexuality, some people who were already a bit further in um, their... Um, uh, mm, mm, being okay with their identity, and like the, the older queers introduced me to some interesting theory. <laughs> um, uh, so I got to... Who are you calling an older queer? Well, just people who are older than me. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I generation before me, uh, and talking about their um, struggles which were similar, although very different than mine. But it was good to feel part of a community where you feel protected and they teach you things. Um, yeah, so Tumblr was the um, first um, platform where I connected uh, with these people. And although I didn't, like I, I worked as an artist, well, I was studying uh, at the academy, um, I didn't really use the internet as an art platform, though when I look at the things that I posted back then, I think that there is a clear line from where I started and what I am doing now. So these were the types of pictures that I would post. Um, very much um, this, like inhabiting this archetype um, from like the sad, depressed, uh, like MySpace, tum uh, MySpace Tumblr girl, which was a whole thing back then. Um, so yeah, it was all like p being playful with um, yeah your place in the big um, world wide web. Anyways, so this is <laughs> where um, I think my talk about my art practice um, starts. So. Um, the first project um, that I really, really, um, um, how do you say it, when, like, um, um, <laughs> uh, like where it was a decision to uh, use social media as a platform for my work, both um, for um, getting the information that I wanted and the output afterwards. So, for... Um, one year, like I was, like I always start from like upset. Don't laugh with me, huh? Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I am being very vulnerable here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, and now what? Okay. Um, so my work always starts very much from um, obsession, and I was at that time. Um, like daily, like for hours on end, looking uh, at the Daily Show and more specifically Sarah Palin videos because I was interested in um, this whole circus and theater that was the American presidential elections. And she specifically was a very interesting figure to me because it was very clear that um, like she was a construction because she got like picked um, almost randomly because she was hot and yeah. Uh, and they put her in um, these neat costumes, uh, and then on the other hand, she would refer to herself as a hockey mom. Her dialect was completely constructed to yes. attract more people. It was not a real uh, Alaskan accent. It was a mixture of different uh, grassroots, uh, grassroots uh, dialects. So anyway, I found that very uh, interesting, and I started to research a bit about how um, these uh, presidential candidates are prepped, well, her as the VP, not the president, um, were prepped and to see how, um, like even in classical Greek theater, there's, there's a lot of overlaps. Anyway, so for one year, um, I went through a transformation where I became a Sarah Palin um, 
a doppelganger. Uh, how do you say it? Du yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not just a lookalike. I inhabited, like, slowly also her political views, which oh. I, yes, yes, which was the interesting thing for me because, yeah, and I'm just gonna show first, um, like, what the end result or one of the end results was of that year. Like, just a small clip. There's no music. Music. <laughs> mm. Okay, in the meantime, mm -hmm. so what I did was I would dress my, in the beginning I would just dress myself up um, as Sarah Palin, also this, this, the costume grew and grew and grew, and I would dress up as her every single day. I would go to school, well, academy like that, I would go to family dinners like that. Um, at some point I went to an anti-abortion um, uh, march, dressed as her, oh which was <laughs> super funny because at some point, like it was in Brussels, but well, I think we don't have that big of a movement here. So mostly it was very Catholic people or Americans that were like maybe expats or something. And then this one lady came up to me and she was like, oh my God, are you the daughter of Sarah Payne? And I'm like, who? Like, why would I dress up as my mom? <laughs> this is very strange. <laughs> um, so, uh, then I started to interact also um, with people on the internet and posing as a very uh, extreme right uh, Republican. And quietly my Facebook also started to change because before that already I used alter egos on Facebook. I would regularly change my name uh, and act in a completely different way. But so then I created well, I changed, so I never create a new profile. I changed my profile to Sarah Palish, and, and quietly everything started to change. Um, so I would make uh, statuses really from the perspective of Sarah Palin and then mix it with like very harsh critique on uh, the system. But so Facebook, um, which obviously um, it, like works on an algorithm, uh, became a bit fucked because they started to send me advertisements for little cottages in Wasilla, Alaska. I got in my <laughs> Gmail um, these like rifle uh, promotions. Very <sighs> interesting. Yeah. Um, I started to practice like the syntax, how she spoke. Yeah, but the video doesn't work. Yeah, okay, well, I, my whole pr like, um, presentation was videos, um, but so we cannot yes, do that. Okay. Selfie song, can we, we cannot do that. Instagram, do I have to stop, stop? I, th I think I'm hearing sound now. I can stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, please, please don't stop. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yes. Okay, is it fixed now? Is the sound fixed? Yeah, we just don't do the sound. I mean, I have a website which you can visit uh, and it will be all very clear sure. what I am doing, Perfect. I think. <laughs> so these are the types of works that uh, are shown in the Modern Love um, exhibition, which uh, are a series of memes, an ongoing series of memes, which is called Niche Content for Frustrated Queers which came about when I was working on a performance, uh, which I did at the opening, Live, Love, Limerence, which was about unrequited love. And I found it difficult to be like present online when o like, I only had one performance and how do I communicate my ideas with people when I don't really have um, like material afterwards. It's really a live performance. I don't like registrations. So then I thought, okay, a really cool way to um, um, deal with um, the s like the subjects that I work around with like heteronormativity, compulsory heterosexuality, dating, um, patriarchal, <laughs> um, <laughs> all of that yes. uh, is to use uh, this very um, um, clear language of the meme. Um, yeah, so uh, that happened. Mm -hmm. 
this we will skip. <laughs> this is the latest series of memes where I finally start uh, being like part of, like, like where it's original images and where I star in uh, the memes because bef like I follow all these weird accounts on Instagram and on Twitter where I just uh, source all the pictures, they're not mine. Okay, this is cool. I really hope now it works. Perfect. So, um, beginning of the quarantine, I didn't have a job because I'm a performer and I couldn't see people anymore. Um, and people couldn't come together anymore. So then I had to start working at Albert Heijn because I needed money <laughs> and also something to do with my time. Um, but then after some months, I got really depressed because then my whole, um, like, my identity was being um, a, um, a store clerk, basically, mm -hmm. and made me sad. So then I wanted to also create an alter ego for that, and so I did all this Albert Heijn work uh, also when I was at home, but then, um, um, like, orchestrated, like, in the theater form. Uh, <laughs> I was first tagging all like my job on Facebook and whatever whenever I posted something, but then uh, I got two warnings <laughs> from the head office <laughs> that I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> but I think it's really good, um, like press. <laughs> But I know, but I know, I think of you every step of the way. There was another bomb, but we have to quit, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's go. Just really quickly. <laughs> Thank you. My God, what a wonderful performance. <laughs> okay, what a wonderful performer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm just going to ask you a few questions because you're going to have a quick Q&A &A afterwards. We're going to open up the floor, but there's a, a, just a brief, uh, just a, a few questions to kind of contextualize this. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I, I think I read in your bio that you, you think that um, you, you, you're interested in glorifying failure. Explain, walk us through that first. Well, all my alter egos, they're quite uh, tragic. Mm -hmm. Well, from Sarah Palin to um, um, the performance that I'm doing tonight, which is about like failed IVF cycles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to uh, Live Love Limerence, which is about unrequited love. And I think like to use somehow like self-deprecating humor um, works really well for me um, to deal with things. So I pose as a, as a, also in the memes as quite a, um, yeah, as a failed artist or, or somebody's, I am struggling with mental health, but like to make it bigger and bigger. As big we all are, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Make it bigger and bigger because that gives like some sort of a protection. I feel like when you put yourself out there and make it so clear that you are vulnerable, it's also kind of a mask mm -hmm. and it protects me um, from, from, yeah, I don't know, how, yeah. Mm. But well, I was going to ask that because, I, I mean, obviously this looks like a self-fashioning that is protective. It really is. Like, how do you hide? Do you, uh, is it that you're hiding behind each identity? Is that it? Or is it that each identity is a kind of layer, like an armor? I find that difficult yes. because I find that my alter egos, in a way, are very authentic. Mm -hmm. um, since I... My, I was born a performer. Mm. This is really like honestly putting myself out there. Mm. But I use some strategies mm. um, where it's unclear to people whether something is fiction yeah. or reality. And that does um, protect me. Because if somebody asks a question mm. after a performance or online and I do not wish to answer it or I do not feel comfortable mm. at that moment to answer it, then it's very easy to... Um, say that 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 was just taken from a movie or from another person or from something that I read, which I like. So I think it's very real 
when it happens in a performance or on the internet, but the protection is more when you have to uh, deal with it afterwards. Yes, yes, yes. Well, what, I, what I've realized is, is it's very it's social interventionist art. I mean, you're really going out there and you're, you're really you're, you're calling shit out, and I love it. In terms of, like the example of, of, of Facebook, um, of um, going out as Sarah Palin and, 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 and the kinds of algor you know, the algorithmic logic of no them now sending you ads for guns and so on, which really exposes you know, something that we all know now about Facebook, right? And secondly, um, even the, uh, the, last, the last set of memes you showed are really about labor, you know, and labor issues. And so, I guess, well, my question is, um, is, it, is, it that, is it that you, you, you d in being political this way, you're, it, it's a way to protect your own feelings? How do you manage your own feelings no, behind no, all of that? No, I use mm -hmm. myself as a vessel yeah. Um, and my mm -hmm. tiny struggles, because it's always, sometimes I feel a bit weird because of course there's much bigger problems than mm -hmm. the things that I talk about. But right. I use myself as um, a vessel to, to um, like, I, I don't want to say teach, but to show people mm -hmm. um, some different realities mm -hmm. and maybe to encourage people also to be vulnerable and, wait, I forgot the question. <laughs> Well, no, I was actually going to ask you, well, for, for example, the Sarah Palin present, um, um, performance, what if somebody comes up to you and says, you know, you bitch! They <laughs> did! <laughs> I got oh hate mail. And what happened? And also Sarah Palin blocked me on Facebook. Are you <laughs> <laughs> so how do you deal with that emotionally? don't care so much. I find it interesting. The work only exists because of interaction with people. Oh it's both God. real life... Uh, performances and also the online is performance, so it wouldn't exist if there's no um, back and forth. So exactly. I want people crying, <laughs> laughing, <laughs> shouting at me. I think it's fantastic. I think it's a, the whole compendium of, 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 of stuff that you're doing in just, in just one performance. You're brave and you're bold. I love it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, now I think it's time. Um, I see. I see the signal. So I think it's time for us to move on to Kira. <coughs> and of course, we're going to bring this all back in play. We, I'm going to keep this in, in, in this tight circle. And Kira, just like with Maraika, I would like to ask you to just let, let's hear in your own voice. Who is Kira Gaunt? Good local time, everyone. Ah, uh, yes. So we're going to uh, while I'm settling in with some audio. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm coming to you live from uh, the capital of New York State, Albany, New York. We call it Smallbany. Uh, I am uh, going to share some of the self-fashioning of social media that I've done in my life in the last 10 years. <clears throat> First, I want to thank um, Jason King at NYU who recommended me for this presentation and I'm very delighted to be a part of the panel. Uh, Jason King is uh, at the Clive Davis Institute in NYU. If, I assume he's been with you before. <laughs> he is a wonderful artist. And I want to acknowledge some of the work I may share is funded by a grant sponsored by the Ms. Foundation for Women and their Girls Fund Initiative. So um, I'm going to tell you a story from the other side of my failure in modern love. Uh, see, I married someone on Facebook that I met on Facebook. Um, so could you go to slide five? I think that's slide. Mm -hmm. Next slide, maybe. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> There's so much craziness surrounding me there's so much going on it gets hard to breathe when all my faith is gone you bring it back to me you make it real for me that is a song that started the love story of my first time getting married um I eventually got an email. I met someone on Facebook, and I got an email uh, about two weeks before the wedding. We had a very short courtship, and it read, Kira, you don't know me, and you have no reason to listen to me or believe me, but I know, let's call him Jack Rigg, and it appalls me that he's possibly using another woman like this. 
You seem like a very nice, accomplished person and clearly in love with him. I know that you met him on Facebook and only met for the first time in person on March 31st. Do you know that you may be the fourth person he has asked to marry him since leaving his wife in 2009? So uh, I want to tell you a little bit about this, how this relates to some work that I do currently. I'm an ethnomusicologist, a digital ethnomusicologist. I study, um, I'm going to take my headset off, I'm still hearing a little, uh, I'm hearing the echo in the theater, <laughs> so I'm just going to take this off. I'll check the chat if there's a problem. problem. Um, thank you. Perfect. So, uh, all of us grow up with love stories. We learn those love stories through a lot of popular media. I learned mine primarily from television and music, and I think most people do. Probably in the U.S., I know that from visiting the Netherlands, um, I was in uh, Rotterdam once and staying with a family and they were watching Sex in the City with their 13 and 14 year old daughter and I was embarrassed because we just don't do that in the U.S. <laughs> um, even though I think um, just sex or talk of sex is through all, all of our media in our families and in our real relationships we do not talk about sex very often. I was talking about it in my hip hop class yesterday and the students were like a little uncomfortable with it, anxiety. So I grew up with all kinds of media that taught me that women, particularly black women, should look for their knight in shining armor, uh, all of the princess things that we learn in the media and so forth. Um, so this song by James Morrison from the UK called You Make It Real For Me was used to woo me during the courtship. If you go to the next slide. Um, uh, at the time, I probably was using social media apps, dating apps to find love. Uh, one of those apps was OkCupid and I found that like the study that was done that said that black women are the least replied to of all races from black men to uh, and reply the most online. That was me on OkCupid, and I call it single black woman singled out again. Next slide. Um, this was uh, the, the message, the sliding in my DMs message that I got from, my, uh, from the man that I eventually married. I hope this is the best year of your life. Somewhere, somehow, some way, someday, I hope we cross paths in life. Um, we had, he had reached out to my DMs maybe in October before then, and I remember he said, I hope you visit, uh, the city that he lived in at the time. And I thought, who is this person? I don't know them. And in a very short period of time, we befriended each other through Facebook. And I began to have a really strong relationship in my head with him. And what I learned in, in the long term was that my sense of, uh, I've had this, this gnawing feeling ever since that when you meet somebody online, you get to create the whole world of who they are for yourself without any signals from someone real, and you can't see any of the things that would distort that impression, especially their relationship to other people, if they're nice to other people, if they have friends, if they're friends with other people. You don't see any of that. Next slide. You can just leave it on the slides just while I go through these and then I'll come back. I'll let you know. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. That slide. So um, this was an Ignite talk, one of these 15 slides in, in 10 minutes, I think. Um, uh, this was a slide of our connection through YouTube. I'm a YouTube scholar and we met um, in an airport in uh, New York City and I decided to make it a big event, to make something real of it. Had my students coordinate recording this video and posted it the first time we ever met. And Jack Riggs said to me the best love stories make, what is it? I can't remember. It said, the best love stories are the real ones. I can't remember what, I can't see my, my text here. A lot of women, not just black women, are taught that, that those, the real title Mrs. is the one that you're seeking. So it was better than my PhD, getting my Mrs. title. Next slide. 
And we got married and we had a Facebook cake. That's what it said. The best love stories are the real ones. Um, we emulated the Facebook feed on our, on our cake, which was the premier moment during the wedding. It was a beautiful, very intimate, small wedding. Uh, my then uh, husband had no guests. That's when I started to get the first signal there was something wrong. I had 30 guests. Um, he had one person that was there for him at the wedding. Next slide. Um, we married in June, and by July, things were really crappy. Um, but on social media, it looked as if everything was perfect. There we are, posed under a flag in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, and you can see the response from people who loved the images and the people who thought that there was something wrong. I, I'm a social media maven connector. I was online a lot but very quickly I was not online very often. And those people who noticed that didn't reflect that to me because they too were enamored of the presentation of the couple online or that I seemed happy and that I performed being happy when I was online to cover my despair. Next slide. So it's hard to accept the truth when the lies were actually what you wanted to hear about wanting to get married, about finding true love. Um, you can stop the slides there. So um, I am now um, almost 10 years out from that. It took me a long time to recover. That song by James Morrison, uh, which was one of many songs that Jack Rigg used to woo me, um, were the same songs that he used to woo the previous women. And I happened to befriend one of the women, who, the woman who's right before me. He, he targeted women of all races. <laughs> well, not all. There were two white women, and then the woman before me was a black woman who lived in my same community in Brooklyn, um, even though my then uh, soon-to-be fiancé told me he'd never been to Brooklyn before. Um, he had actually been courting someone for over a year who was from Brooklyn and actually visited a place not far from where I lived, um, but never told me that. And so the work that I do now relates again to this self-fashioning of in the age of social media, this, um, this distortion, this uh, context collapse, the blurring of publicity and privacy that disorients or destabilizes one's perception of what's real and what's not. Uh, my research is now about black girls um, and how they are victims of how music orchestrates violence, particularly sexual grooming online. Um, so uh, I'm gonna read you a couple of framing uh, quotes and ideas that help you think the way that I've begun to think from a data set that I have of over a thousand videos collected in 2014 of black girls twerking videos. Twerking is popping, locking, dropping, and bouncing your booty to the beats and rhymes of a rap song. Uh, and it could be pop song as well. Um, I was very interested. My first book was about um, the hidden musicianship of black girls from their game songs and play from hand clapping games cheers and double dutch and how their musical practices were appropriated or sampled by male artists to drive attention to new music um, the same thing is happening with twerking videos where young emerging music bedroom producers will um, make songs that make very young girls dance and make self uh, produced videos that accompany those songs. You may know the most recent example, uh, a young 14-year-old girl named uh, Jalea Harmon, Jalaya Harmon, uh, choreographed a dance on TikTok to a song. Uh, I can't remember the name of the song, but the song, of course, went to the top of the Billboard charts. The dance is called The Renegade, um, and there's a lot of complicated issues. I've ri I wrote about it last year in the New York Times in a piece called The Magic of Black Girls Play. Um, so here's a couple of framing ideas. Who we sleep with, how we dress, and the music we listen to define us politically in a more immediate way than who we vote for, what dogma we espouse, and which racial box we check on the census. 
This was Lisa Jones. She's a black American um, journalist who wrote a book called Bulletproof Diva in 1995. This is uh, one of my virtual mentors. We've never, well, we've, I've been at some of her events. Her name is Bernice Johnson Regan. She's the founder of a group called Sweet Honey in the Rock from DC, my home. Um, she was also the founder of the singing movement in Albany, same title as my city that I live in today, Albany, Albany, Georgia, the start of the singing movement that we all know of that's associated with the civil rights movement. She writes, oh, she spoke in an interview with PBS interviewer Bill Moyer. Sound, she maintained, is a way to extend the territory you can affect. So song will maintain the air as your territory. She said, people can walk into you way before they can get close to your body. So here's my claim for the new book that I'm writing about music and how it orchestrates sexual grooming and other forms of violence against black girls online. If chronic exposure to racism causes weathering for black women, there's a, a mountain of research about this, causes uh, high infant mortality rates. So, um, so if chronic exposure to racism causes weathering, like a drip of water on a pavement weathering the pavement down, what does chronic and ubiquitous listening or exposure to music or sexist music cause? Music, I assert, is orchestrating violence against girls online, and black girls are the canary in the coal mine. Groomed from girlhood. Um, before children, uh, the distinction of sexual grooming is that before children are sexually abused, they are often groomed by abusers. I want to assert that on social media, platforms like YouTube, TikTok, before that it was MySpace, or they're connecting with comments through Kick apps or other kinds of messaging apps. Before they are physically or sexually abused, general audiences, music and tech companies, exploit black girls dance and bedroom play online. Um, in social media, black girls tend to be the butt of the joke. Um, there are probably many memes that you've been exposed to where some black female figure is the butt of a joke. One of the most famous ones that I recall was from around, 19, uh, around 2013. Well, there's one from 1999 before the internet launched that was an email that circulated of a one-eyed green um, alien singing I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor and then being crushed by a disco ball. Um, the, the animator of that segment, Victor Navone, swears that the figure was not a woman, it was a man. But all of the gestures signify black drag queen or black woman. Popping neck, hand roving, hip on, uh, hand on hip, and singing Gloria Gaynor's voice, I Will Survive. Uh, another example of this the, is that YouTube launched its platform on the back of Janet Jackson's Nipplegate. Uh, fiasco, which nearly ruined her career. Um, the last example for me is this set of data that I have about black girls. So here are the distinctions of grooming, and then I'll land this plane, as we say. Um, <clears throat> grooming, uh, hold on one second. Um, here we go. Uh, grooming has these distinct characteristics. You get special attention, which is what social media does for kids who are under the third, age of 13. Uh, you get isolated from others. So if you're in your bedroom, you're already isolated. It fills a need often that, role, that, that one desires from, from one's family. So if you don't feel really connected to your parents as you grow, go through adolescence or your siblings, social media and creating media online from your bedroom fits that need gradually crosses physical boundaries, even in public. Well, today we live online in public, especially during quarantine, so that blurring is right there. Music engenders trust. It's one of the oldest aspects of our um, shift from a biological life into culture. Uh, and it leads kids to um, this, this enticement and exposure to music 
in platforms like YouTube, which is the number one music discovery channel and the number one space before 2019, end of 2019, for kids to migrate online because you don't have to learn any text, you don't have to meet anything, you just upload a video and interact that way. Um, this is where child-produced sexual imagery becomes prominent uh, and adverse childhood experiences can be not only groomed by predators or people who are targeting young girls, but the general audience who watch these videos will blame black girls, especially in twerking videos, for any adverse experience or interactions that they have. And so this really lends itself to a different way of thinking about what self-fashioning in the age of social media means. Um, our self is a highly social one. It was before the internet, it still is, but in much more intense and complicated, globalizing ways online. And so that's just a little taste of the work I'm doing and my path to it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kira. I can wow. hear the applause. Yes. What, an effect, <laughs> what an affective shift we call this. Wow. Um, and Kira, thank you so much. That was, that was yeah, um, in many ways chilling, but in many ways very, very, I think, um, inspiring, I think. I hope I hope I feel that everybody feels that way too. But Kira, I, I, I think I will first of all thank you for really, you know, bearing your soul like this. I mean, I really, I know it must, it can't be, it can't be easy. Um, but I just wanted a, a few quick questions, which I hope are sensitive questions. Um, about what you've just said. Um, and I think one of the things I'm really interested about is what you said about, well, you said, it, you know, all women are kind of, are vulnerable to being, um, you know, to growing up in a world where, you know, they're, they're, they're taught to be, to, to accept vulnerability and even naivete as, as a kind of, as a, as, a, as a positive attribute of femininity. And I think your cautionary tale is, is really telling us otherwise. Um, but I wanted to ask you, um, it's, it sounds like you're suggesting that there is a specific way that black women are miseducated, different from other women. Could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I want to make sure that, I, that I'm clear that um, this is impacting all of those people whose identity is fashioned as female, whether that's... Uh, by choice in being a drag queen or by their heart and soul who they're moved to be. So that includes trans women or feminine presenting men. Um, so this has larger implications, but for black women, um, just the R. Kelly case is a great example of this. For 30 years, uh, people have known in Chicago, writ just locally throughout the city, people knew that R. Kelly was preying on very young girls, and um, in the industry there's been an attempt to expose that information uh, with evidence, taken to court many times, but uh, not unlike Bill Cosby, um, not unlike Russell Simmons, not unlike, since my work is about hip-hop, I really look at girls in hip-hop contexts. Not unlike uh, Africa Mambata, the father, the godfather of hip-hop, who was molesting boys um, or accused of molesting boys and has totally dropped out of the public sphere as a result. Um, these things don't seem to rise to the level of like the Black Lives Matter movement, started by black women, but we are not the people that people are trying to protect from the harms of anti-blackness, especially when it involves sexism. Um, and so that would be my response to that, is that uh, one of the reporters, the investigative journalist who exposed the R. Kelly, he's been working on the case for 30 years, said that, you know, the only reason that it didn't go anywhere was because it was black girls. Probably could say the same thing of Native American girls. Or immigrant yeah. girls who are brown. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. These are some excellent points. And I think, well, I don't, I, I hope I have a little bit more. One more question before we toss it. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm thank, thanks for, having more, for giving me more time with this. Um, I, well, I wanted to ask you because, of course, I read in your material here that you, and this is the inspiring part of, of your work, at least from what I've seen, is that you talk about being born again on Facebook. You know, oh, um, you no, said no, it's no. been 10 years since. 
Sorry? This is, this is, this is uh, my ex-husband. You know, we both have a public profile. Uh -huh. and, I, and I thought as I presented the slides, maybe I should blur his face out. But um, it's, but, it's but public. I lost later. Uh, he's, sure. he's, he's a public. <laughs> it was him that was born again on Facebook. Oh, so what sure. happened was mm -hmm. when we separated or when the previous women separated from him, He'd get a, all the people would be disenchanted with him and unfriend him, and then another crew of people would come in. He was a former pastor. So he was born again on Facebook, oh, I not see. me. I, see. <laughs> I well, actually retreated from social media. I've, I've never really been comfortable yeah. being as prominent on say, social media as before 2011. I've just not returned to that kind of level of interaction, mm -hmm. even though I do research on social media. <laughs> Ah. Well, I was going to ask because um, I was going to ask, well, uh, is there a way that you think maybe you can suggest maybe advice you can give us that, um, for, let's say, you with a person, let's say, in a post-traumatic space trying to be born again. Is it possible, and I'm speaking from the perspective of, of self-fashioning here, um, is it possible yeah. to, to regenerate online through self-fashioning, do you think? Is it impossible yeah. after... after after hearing your story, do you think it's possible at all for someone like you? And I've had a similar experience. I think some of us in the audience might, might have similar experiences. But can we self-regenerate? Do you think the, the, the internet is a place, social media could be a place to give us that possibility? Um, I think from a very ne neoliberal kind of perspective, mm -hmm. I, I think that the problem is calling it self-fashioning. There is no self-fashioning. You're constantly being shaped by the people around you. As Irving Goffman's work talks about, self-presentation in the everyday is about that I'm always performing because there's someone to perform for. Um, the problem is that, that that thing has gotten narrow and narrower and narrower and more isolating and more isolating, less unions. I mean, this, is, this has political ramifications, not only in the everyday and in the, in the personal, in the interpersonal, it has everything to do with the intrapersonal, right? The Facebook study that just was revealed by the Wall Street Journal that said girls are being disproportionately harmed by the way that they interact on in Instagram. Um, I already knew that. I've been trying to expose that since 2015, 2016, when one of the girls in my data set, we were able to find, uh, with an invest it took me four months, an investigative journalist contacted me and said, I'd like to look at your data set. I said, I haven't been able to find any girls. Uh, I'm going to get to the inspiring part, uh, the, re the, the, the silver lining, so to speak, is that it took us four months to reach Google to get them to look at one video of the one girl we were able to actually engage with on YouTube. YouTube is not a social networking site. It's a social networked site, a uh, shareable economy site. Um, and then... Uh, that one video was removed. It took us four months. Electronic Frontier Foundation, a journalist, an attorney, for me to figure out some things, and they only wanted to see that one video. By 2019 in October, our Federal Trade Commission here in the U.S. fined Google $170 million, along with New York State, for invasion of children's privacy online. I think the silver lining is to be more uh, social-minded, to be more uh, communal, communist, little c, about what we do online. We, we need to stop performing for these massive audiences we will never know and see and start to make these kind of um, safe gardens of where, you know, like we've done during COVID, where we have our pods, where we interact with people so that we're not exposing ourselves to so much unintended harm or what becomes intentional harm because it's repeated over and over again. And we all know we get love bombed. Uh, people then show their true colors and start gaslighting you. Um, they try to make you the problem because nobody wants to own, you know, just like. So we have to learn to refashion the way we think about what we, who we are as individuals online. There's no such thing. I'm always going to be performing just like I am now. I got dressed for this. I made sure I wore my right earrings. I made sure um, I might have my, um, my these are not pants that I would go out in public with. 
because <laughs> I'm not showing that part of my body. So that's not a self-fashioning. That's a self-social fashioning. So I call it organism environment. This is John Dewey's transactionalist philosophy. You always have to, and, and what I want to argue in my book is that this ecological fitness is missing. The idea that one needs to be fit for public presentation and that that public is global. It's both the people who will know me and my network from seeing this video online and the people who I will never know. Like I have a 7 million viewed TED, talk, TED video. Um, I've had people I've just randomly met on Facebook who are like, I've seen that video. And it's, or I've met people face to face who knew me only on Twitter who acted like they knew me. So we have to learn, it's just not media literacy. We need to learn new social skills. So when I met that person who knew me on Twitter, I don't know her. I felt really uncomfortable with her coming up to me as if we knew each other. So to distinguish how you know someone online versus how you know someone offline, we need to maybe have like a peace sign pie chart that says, okay, I know a third of you from knowing you online. And you need to learn who you are, not only offline, but the people you know offline, and if I want to be a part of that community or not. And you need to meet mine. So I think it's inspiring that we get to now re, what is it, reset, uh, reinvent. Um, I want to take the fashion part because I think that's also getting in the in the way. It's not fa about fashioning. Well, I, I was going to I was going to say that I think um, you, one 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 part of it one part of it that you that, that you missed Ray, in your wrap up was was the point you raised earlier, which I think is also a brilliant point and a brilliant way to to to, to reimagine this this notion of fashioning because you also say it's the way we fashion what we see and who we see. It's that in our heads we also fashion um, the people in f the people we see on the screen, and it's not just self fashioning but fashioning of the other. So it's this but, is a really but here's if if I may. Here's the thing, um, there, are, there are things internal to us that are fashioning what we do because we haven't eaten well, our microbiome. So the things that, we're, that are below our threshold of consciousness that are acting upon us, that's why the whole social media platforms can take advantage and exploit our attention, is there's things below our threshold of awareness that are driving what we're doing. And until we learn that there are things below our threshold of awareness, we can't really fashion anything. We are following. <laughs> we are being followed. We are liking and being liked. And it may not have any authentic grounding in reality. For some questions, and I think we also have questions coming in from the online audience. Um, can, yes? Just a show, a show of hands, yes. Good, I can see the audience now. Just by a show of hands. Questions, comments, observations. Also, the online audience, you're welcome to, to plunge in as well. Hmm. <laughs> Dead silence. Well, okay. I, I, I first of all want to ask. I have, I have quite a few questions of my own, but um, but I think well, obviously, it's we go from the glorification of failure to really a story about the harsh reality of failure, um, of modern love, and so I think to bring both of you together, um, I think the first thing is Maraika, You talked about well, you talked about alter egos. Well, not being something, not just something that you can use as, as a political intervention, but something that's almost healing right, for you. Um, and, well, I was going to ask you to talk a little bit more about the healing alter ego, and then I wanted to talk to Kira about, about this question of, um, you know, Maraika bringing up um, a way of, uh, well, self-fashioning or fashioning herself that is actually uh, regenerative or healing. Um, I just wanted to get Maraika, um, 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 Kira's t take on that first. But Maraika, yeah, what would you say about this, this, this healing, this healing magic of, of, of um, the alter ego? The artistic um, alter ego. A little bit like, how do you say that like when you speak something into existence? Like if you create mm. the, the alter ego before you feel a specific mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. and you start acting like that, mm -hmm. then for me it becomes reality at some point. Mm -hmm. This is how I deal with therapy or mm -hmm. uh, this is what I did with like getting okay with my sexuality. Yeah. And I still have things that I question but then I still put them in some type of alter ego, mm -hmm. and this for me works uh, in a healing way. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think then, would you use the same term born again that Kira uses? No. Nah. That's a useful, a useful term? So, how do you explain, how do you inhabit and leave these, these, these alter egos? Or are, are they just existing, um, are they existing characters that, you, that, that just revolve around you and, and, and that occupy you from time to time? How they does it work mechanically? They used to be very, like, they, um, mm -hmm. they used to never uh, exist at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was also because for 10 years after I graduated high school, I didn't make any work that was really uh, personal, because my teachers told me <laughs> that I shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, wow. But so when I um, made the first uh, performance, then the alter egos, they came more naturally mm -hmm. because they also don't have any different names anymore. Oh, okay. There's, no, like they, they are, they are parts of like an authentic self that is mm -hmm. me, but they are curated in a way that I can strive towards becoming that mm -hmm. alter ego. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, it makes perfect sense. Yes. It does. Yes. yes. Okay, okay, may, Peter, I, was, I, yeah, yeah, you, I wanted to hear you. May I ask Mar Maria? Mar I love, I think what you're doing as a performance artist is helping others, perhaps as well as yourself, see that we have multiple selves that we can craft. Um, the silver lining for me in, in that, like I'm, I'm, I'm a much happier person because I uh, lifted up the hood and understood what happened to me. And what you're doing is actually crafting from that world. It's almost similar to what people who write Afrofuturism are trying to do. They're trying to take speculative fiction and tell the world that we want, to either expose the world's um, hidden discourses, ideologies, or to craft new worlds that we can imagine by performing, by embodying them, not just thinking about them. It's hard work. It doesn't work all the time. Yeah. But that's great. That's better than, that's better than pretending mm -hmm. that all your curated Instagram things mm -hmm. are perfect. <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> well, just so we don't end up with mixed messages, though, you know, um, uh, well, Marika, you ended up, you ended by, by telling us, or I guess the, the, the moral of your story is that, you know, authenticity, is, sorry, inauthenticity is actually quite good and quite healing. Whereas Kira is kind of, is kind nah. of, oh, no, no, all right, correct me. No, me, as I said in wrong. the beginning, like, I think I have a very performative um, identity, yeah. but it is authentic. It's not about We cannot have the whole discussion you. about right. what is authentic and what exactly. not, but in my experience, mm -hmm. uh, I feel the, per the mm -hmm. performativity or whatever, or yeah. the alter egos, they don't stand in the way of authenticity. Right. Right. Well, well, Kira. Then, uh, well, what would you say about this this question of authenticity in, uh, based on your experience? Because you suggested um, that you know you, you're calling for us to be more authentic. I think. Am I am I wrong? Um, in in how we relate, how we go about self fashioning, um, or how we go about this sort I'm, of the use of art to create the self online. I'm yes. Sorry. <laughs> the little lag. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm not calling for. Authenticity, capital A. I'm not even. I, I wouldn't even use authenticity. No. I, I'm more interested in accountability between people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and that the performative things that Marika is doing helps us see that there is an exchange of ideas happening with ourselves, not to mention with others, and that that performance yields certain, like she said, she felt like she was Sarah Palin and that she started espousing and feeling the learned ways of thinking, feeling, believing and behaving that go, that's culture, def like a little shorthand definition of culture, that go with that kind of embodied behavior, that it was very easy to slip into what goes consistent with that. Um, I've done a little theater, I used to hate theater. I used to hate it. <laughs> I'm like, I want to be a performer, a singer. I can do, you know, but theater, I don't want to do. Musical theater, I don't want to do until, um, until you find the sweet spot in that. And then you're like, oh my God. Or uh, I, I think there's something about acknowledging that from the cradle to the grave, you will have many selves. You are not your adolescent self. You're not, um, 
but uh, like where I am right now, I'm 59, about to be 60. I know I look good. Um, uh, <laughs> but what's been creeping in my mind is uh, when I see myself, uh, I was at the TED headquarters for a workshop the other day, and my hair, because of technology, my hair looked really white. Now, I, I don't know if you know about the Shirley card and the filter and the and the 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 um, visual technology that's still embedded in in tech is that it's it's filtered for white skin right which is why if I move a certain way my skin color is going to change if the lighting because the camera does not know how to filter for my dark skin so I realize that my hair is having the same problem because I'm kind of a salt and peppery or peppery salt I don't know which one it is but when I saw the video of myself, I was like, oh my God, I look like I have completely gray hair. And then it triggers the narrative that I've grown up with, that people are old. And then I start to think, oh, I need to do something about that. And so this is what I mean by the self is social. I'm an organism in an environment, not of physicalness, but of ideologies that I've inherited, that I've birthed with. And I think people who are acting or writing fiction, they know this inherently. Those of us who live our everyday lives don't learn this very well. We think, I'm always going to be sad, or I'm always going to be fat, or, <laughs> you know, okay. like, and right. instead well, of you can change it. Yes. Yeah, well, I think we can. I think we can, and you're suggesting that. Um, I think both of you are suggesting that, right, that we can always change this. Yeah, but you keep so, the yeah. other identities. Exactly. You mean, it's still <laughs> ch like the child, the inner child is still there, all of that. But I mean, yes. whoever's okay. inside no. me, I'm sorry. still me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, guys, I'm sorry, but that's all we have time for. I think we're out of time now, but I think this is a conversation that can go on and on and on, you know, for infi to, you know into infinity. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, I guess we can all wait to see you perform online sometime. Yeah, and also tonight. Tonight, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that too. Well, everybody, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to, to this wonderful panel. I hope you, got, you guys enjoyed it as much as we did. Thank you. Thank you.